Thank you, Mr. Gupta. Your words have been very insightful, and I'm sure you've opened many uh, minds today uh, to the idea of private equity investment in their companies. Moving towards the last keynote address, I invite Mr. Tarun Sharma to deliver his address. Mr. Tarun Sharma, with 13 years of experience in various roles in venture capital investing and equity research, is currently the MD of NEA India, a leading venture capital firm focused on helping entrepreneurs build transformational businesses across multiple stages, sectors, and geographies. He will be addressing a question that I'm sure is hovering over all the minds sitting here today. PE exit, pains and gains. Over to you, Mr. Sharma. Thank you. Uh, so it's pain pretty much more than gains, actually. Uh, but one thing you missed out is, uh, so I did, uh, Ahmedabad is really special for me because I did my MBA here. So it's, a, it's, it's always good to come back and thank you for that opportunity. Um, so when I was asked to speak about the exit, um, over the last uh, 12 odd years, um, you know, looking at India, we have been through several cycles. I mean, there was one in 2006 to 2008, which was a big spurt of growth investments happened. Then we saw the consumer internet boom in 2013, 14, and then maybe right now we are going through a fintech bubble after the demonetization. But eventually you end up losing, investors end up losing money after each of these hype cycles or bubbles go through. But let's look at one example that I've quoted here. In that 2005 to 2008 time frame, around 45 billion got invested into India. And um, 10 years now, typical fund lasts for uh, roughly around 10 years. So 10 years are over. Only 19 billion out of that has got returned. So the investors who deployed that money pretty much are not going to see any capital back. I mean, 50% of the capital is eroded, it's gone. Um, and as Dhanpal was saying, 95% of it comes from outside. So these are large endowments, pension funds, sovereign funds who put money into India expecting returns. This, these guys are not going to come back to India in a hurry. They're going to wait and watch while the next wave of exits come back. So what that effectively means is the next wave of Indian entrepreneurs may not get the capital they need. The risk capital that we've all been talking about is required for entrepreneurship just because we have gone so wrong on the exits in the last wave that happened. I think what it behooves us to do is really look very strongly and do a very honest post-mortem. What went wrong? How do we make sure it doesn't get, happen again? Because this is an asset class which is very, very critical for India. So, uh, you know, and when you start looking at, you know, you ask people, you look at what's coming in the media, on why did these exits not happen? Why did we end up losing so much money? Uh, the question, the response is typically somebody else is to blame, right? The fund manager would say, oh, the, you know, the entrepreneur was not willing to sell. We had a buyer on the table. The entrepreneur would say, oh, the IPO markets were dead and I couldn't do an IPO. Um, it, it, there was, what, lack of domestic M&A options and so on. Uh, although, yes, all of them may be true. But I think we still have to do a lot more soul searching and see how can both entrepreneurs on this side and, uh, on sorry, investors on this side, I think of myself as an entrepreneur, but also entrepreneurs can work together to make sure that this virtuous cycle of investment and exit just keeps on churning uh, in India. Um, and that's what I've given some examples on, uh, on, on how, you know, it gets typically done in a formulaic approach and what maybe we can do differently going forward. So here's, the, here's what uh, used to happen, right? We, you would sit, as an investor, sit across the table with an entrepreneur and have a very formal-like approach. Okay, boss, we need to do an IPO of this business. You're going to be so big in X years. And the negotiation would only be, oh, IPO we'll do in three years or seven years. And then you'll finalize a number and move on with it. The lawyers would come in, and they would put together what's called a very, you know, formal-like, -like, again, exit waterfall. If in five years we don't do an IPO, then we'll do a sale to a financial investor, then we'll, or if that doesn't happen, we'll do a buyback, blah, blah, blah. And that got you know, built into the agreement and so on. But what was the problem was that it was, again, uh, from an investor perspective to begin with, we need to start reimagining that. If an industry is not, it's not possible to do an IP or as an investor we believe there's a lot more value unlocking through a strategic, let's kick the IPO out. Let's only talk about an uh, M&A. And my co-panelists talked about it, that let's have that discussion that, look, I'll only do an M&A. If there's enough cash flow, I'll only do a buyback. And let's move away from what has been the standard approach. Because in 2006 to 2008, that was another problem. IPO markets were doing well. Everybody thought that's going to continue. And we are going to get an exit through that. So 
just get, uh, let's try and think about what multiple diverse exit paths we can, we can create. And the next point is more critical, which is it doesn't matter if I as an investor go in my room and I'm thinking about oh, all these exit opportunities I'll create unless you get a promoter buy-in. Lots of times, and I have seen that, there was not a principle-to-principle -principle discussion on how are we going to get that happen. And Dhanpal raised a very important point. You sit across the table, look at the promoter in the eye, and have that discussion. Are you willing to sell your business? If in five years we believe that is going to be the likely uh, value unlocking scenario, let's, can we talk about that? And it, should, it doesn't always need to be a backup. And things do change. I'm not, I mean, all of us have seen how you start off with one thesis and things completely change. But having a starting point is always better than having zero starting point. So I would, uh, I would always um, uh, sort of now at a point where encourage both entrepreneurs and, pro and investors to have that discussion at the outset. In fact, have it before the term sheet that let's talk about exit. How are we going to get the exits? In fact, uh, you know, when I sit in the, uh, our ICs in the US, in the first meeting with the entrepreneur, the first five questions, you talk about exit. How are you going to generate an exit for me? In India, it's treated like a four letter word. You don't even talk about it, you, you know, dance around that topic and come to it later. But as India is maturing, we will get there. I don't think that that's going to be the, be the issue. The, the, the third point here, which is, uh, which is the critical point, um, in actually executing it, and you know, when I was a young investor, I always used to think, oh, it's so easy. You just make sure you get the performance. When you want to do an exit, you hire a banker. He'll go, he'll get buyers on the table. There'll be term sheets, and I'll pick, and it'll be so smooth. The challenge there is the entrepreneur on the other side is getting, has got, probably got private equity for the first time. The exit, he's going to do it for the first time. You really need to work together on driving that process. It's, you cannot hold it in somebody else's hand or you cannot wait till the very end to do it. So here's the way that we have tried to do it. It's, I'm just uh, giving an example of how we approach it right now. So the first thing, once we figure out the path to an exit, and let's take, for example, an IPO, then we try and map out what the milestones the company should achieve or what the nature of the business should be by the time we approach an exit. And I'll give you examples. So we quantify, let's take, what should be your market position? Is it more important to be in the top three in India? Is it more important to be number one in South India? What should be your revenue mix? Uh, should it be from, if you're an IT product company, of product versus sales? How do you want to position your um, institutional sales versus direct-to-consumer sales platforms? And how should your revenue mix look like? What should be your margin profile? So you try and be as objective, quantify this map, and say, guys, you are here right now. The more you improve it, this is what we believe your impact on the valuation can be. And hence, over the next, next five years, let's keep this strategic map. It's not a static map. You will revisit it. You will keep on looking at it. But at least from an entrepreneur, promote, promoter, investor perspective, you have a go-to plan in place. It's not that you're, you know, one year before the exit deadline, you wake up and then you speak to the uh, entrepreneur about, shall we start hiring an IPO banker or not? So that's the engagement that we like to bring in. The other, um, the other way to think about it is also from a process perspective. IPOs have become very complicated right now. You need to start planning for it you know, months in advance. However, on the M&A side, the same uh, kind of deliberate thinking is required. I'll give you an example. We have a company in the med tech space and those companies have typically, let's take around four to seven strategic uh, buyers globally. But w we did our analysis and we figured out for all the uh, mergers or acquisitions that they'll do, they will typically end up engaging much in advance. So what we have started doing, even though we are three years away from the exit, we have already started doing technical collaborations with these guys across various product groups so that we end up having a multiple buyer universe at the end of the, when we reach our exit timeline. And in that, again, we don't have, you know, a civ IPO path plan. They were looking for an MNA. So that, even for exit path that you want to envisage, you have to plan for it in advance and engage with the promoter in advance. And like, like I say here, like most problems in life, this problem of exit can be really solved with communication and very transparent uh, discussions with the promoter, between the promoter and the entrepreneurs. And the last, last point is on, on this one is, uh, the 
if we can get this right, this engagement on exits, there are several tailwinds, uh, tailwinds in India. And we, I am very optimistic that the next five, six years will be a very good exit environment. I've just highlighted this year that we are seeing MA interest from new geographies. So, for instance, in our portfolio companies, we are, getting in, uh, we are seeing interest from uh, uh, geographies such as Japan, Australia, Europe, which were not there earlier. So, new geographies are seeing interest. There will be good MA interest coming in. IPO markets are getting more resilient and robust in India. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, the SIPs were around 2,000 crore a month um, uh, into India, into the stock market, probably less than two years back. Uh, it's right now at 6,000 crore. So $1 billion, close to $1 billion of domestic money enters the stock market every month, which has given a lot of resilience to the IPO markets in India. Uh, and the, the last point here is the next gen entrepreneurs in India are a lot more aligned to the timelines for an investor. If I was to do a hospital deal 10 years back, the doctor would say, yes, let's do, an, uh, let's do a deal. I have my son here. He's studying to be a doctor. He's already a doctor. He will take up the hospital and he's going to take it over so there's no talk of a sale. If I do a discussion with that right now, the doctor will say, yeah, my son is in Stanford. He's doing something in artificial intelligence. He'll set up his own company there. There is no way. I don't have anyone to take up the company. I would like to monetize it along with you. So the alignment of um, timelines is happening more and more because the intergenerational transfer of vocation is not happening, but the intergenerational transfer of wealth needs to happen. So the monetization that's happening uh, that an PE guy would seek the entrepreneur is working on the same timeline. So we see that happening more and more. Um, and so what, uh, just, to sum, uh, just to wrap up here, my expectations are the exit environment is going to be uh, very benign. Uh, this will result in a lot of uh, capital going back and which will result in a lot of co capital coming back in. So once we get the virtual, virtual cycle going, it's going to be a very vibrant environment for entrepreneurs. So I'm excited for you guys. Thank you.